Amen. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 4. Luke, chapter 4. Uh, I, I don't know, this message is, uh, it's not, uh, to me, it's not anything that uh, you don't know. It's probably going to be sound like something I've preached before. Uh, and um, to be honest with you, I sat down yesterday morning and I had something I was going to work on and I started putting verses up on the screen and um, and I, I stopped for a minute and I prayed and I said, Lord, I don't want to preach anything outside of your will. I don't want to preach anything that's that you don't want preached. And so, God, if this is, you know, what I've got in my mind and what I've already worked on, if that's not the message, then you change it for me. And uh, so I started putting things together and I started seeing things. And and next thing I know, God changed it. And I'm thankful for it because uh, I just I want to give out what God tells me to give and, and to do what God tells me to do. And uh, I hope you receive a lot of joy in this. There's something here probably for everybody and something you probably uh, maybe no, but if you don't know, let it be a blessing to you. Luke chapter 4, are we there? Say amen. Um, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as, was, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now this is Jesus. Now he's, he's just been through his 40 days of fasting. And he's dealt with the devil. He's, he's been tempted. The Bible says he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he passed that test in the wilderness. Now he's come uh, down from the wilderness. And now he's, he's coming to Nazareth where he was raised. And he's going into the synagogue as was their custom. Every Sabbath day they went into the synagogue. Sort of like us being here today. And, uh, and uh, they, it was uh, the custom that one of the men from the area, that if they came that day, that they would stand up and they would read a portion of the Old Testament, read a portion of the Scriptures. There, so, verse 17, there was delivered unto him, and I want you to notice it says, the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Esaias. And when he had opened the book, and I want you to think about that this morning, he found the place where it was written, and he's quoting from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I want you to think about that in your life. Do you have the Spirit of the Lord on upon you, in you, working in you, moving you in your life, taking you in the direction that God wants for you in your life, doing the things that God wants to do in your life? Do you have the Spirit of the Lord? Now, there's churches all over this town and churches all over this country that would have something to say about what the Holy Spirit is. Some say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit comes down, everybody rolls around, everybody speaks in tongues, everybody does this, everybody laughs, or, or whatever. Or the Holy Ghost is, uh, I don't know, some, some just sort of philosophical ideology in their head that do, has no real substance in their life. But I'm here to tell you, the Holy Spirit is real. It is the, it is the third part of the Godhead. We believe that there are three that bear record in what, in, as one. The Father, the Word... And the Holy Ghost and these three are one. This is what 1 John 5, 7 says, and that's what we believe. And I believe that every born-again, Bible-believing Christian is going to have. It's not that they should have. It's not that, well, maybe it'll show up sometime in their life. I'm telling you that if you believe the Bible and you believe Jesus as your Savior and God has given you of His Spirit and it's inside of you working things and doing things that you cannot do for yourself, I believe that the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. And what will be happening is what I'm going to show you from the Bible. What happens to a person when the Spirit of the Lord is upon them? So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I believe in reaching out to people that everybody else rejects. Everybody else will turn their back on. As a church, we're not going after the rich doctors and the lawyers and everybody else who's got money and the people of, uh, of high substance in this community. I wouldn't mind reaching poor people who have nothing because it's the people who have nothing, who have nothing to lose but to follow Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. And what he's offering them, that he'll, God will take the poorest people in this world and give them the riches of heaven. Somebody say amen. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So you think about that. If you're sitting here today or you're listening to me and you've got a broken heart, the Spirit of the Lord is preaching you today. God wants to heal your broken heart. To preach deliverance to the captives. I want you to think about that. If you're in bondage this morning to sin, if you're in bondage this morning to pride, if you're in bondage this morning to uh, things that are habitual in your life and you cannot conquer them, you cannot, you cannot get over them, you cannot stop them, you are a captive, the devil has you in his grips, and Christ wants to deliver you. And this is why we preach... Uh, in our churches, we preach deliverance to the captives. If you've been set free, say amen. amen. Recovering of sight to the blind. What well, I was, I was lost and now I'm found, was blind and now I see that song Amazing Grace says, at one time in my life I was blind, but, and not physically, but spiritually. Spiritually blind to the things that I was doing. Spiritually blind to what I needed in my life. And God opened my eyes. And he, and so he, and he, but, and he, uh, recovering a sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're listening to me this morning, and you feel battered. You feel like you've just been beat up. You feel like the devil has kicked you around, tossed you around, thrown you around. You feel like the situations of life has bruised you. Jesus Christ took stripes on his back. So that our infirmities and our bruisings could be healed. So to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Can I tell you that this year, 2017, has been the acceptable year of the Lord. Christ has opened up His arms and welcomed anybody who will come to Him for wanting forgiveness, wanting salvation, wanting eternal life. Wanting to not go to hell and spend eternity in the lake of fire. Christ has opened His arms wide and saved people this year. And I believe He'll do it again next year. But if He doesn't, then right now is the acceptable year of the Lord. Now's the time to accept Christ. And then verse 20, the Bible says He closed the book. He gave it again to the minister and sat down. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened. On him. Now I want you to think about what's been done here. Here's Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's, he's the creator of everything. And he goes into the synagogue and they take that book. And he opens that book up. That's, he's doing something. He's showing you something. And I've preached on this many times, but maybe there's somebody here today or maybe somebody listening has never heard this. And I want you to understand what God will do for you. I want you to understand that when we read our Bibles, and I preach this Bible, I have no power and authority and wisdom to give you anything from this Bible if Jesus Christ does not come in this place, open up His book, and give you His words, you'll walk out of here just, as, just the same way that you walked in this place. Hungry and destitute and without anything, Christ and Christ alone is the one who needs to preach to you today. Not me. So he's the only one that can open that book. And I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. And so he, he took that book and he opened it up. And then he closed it. God wants to do something. in But the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and gave him the ability to do that. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Revelation, chapter 5. This is Christ. And now he's in heaven. And he's at the right hand of God. There is something else that is at the right hand of God. We're going to see that this morning in the Scriptures. Revelation chapter 5. By the way, the right hand in the Bible represents power. Now, if you're left-handed, just kind of reverse that. But in the Bible, the right hand is the hand of power. There are things that my right hand can do that my left hand cannot do. This is my weak side, and this is my strong side, and this is my good side. Thought I'd throw that in. But this, this is my right hand. I can, do th I, can, I can do things I cannot do with my left hand. It is weak. Uh, when we shake hands, what do we do? Right hand. Unless, you know, you don't have a right hand. You shake somebody's left hand. But typically, it is a right hand deal. The swords generally are carried in the right hand. The right hand is that picture of strength and power and authority. When a king rules, 
He holds a scepter. That scepter represents his authority and his dominion and his right to rule. Well, in this case here, there's something in the right hand of God. Jesus, by the way, is standing at the right hand of God. And what he's doing right now is that when you pray, it does not go through me to God. It does not go through Mary to God. It does not go through St. Joseph or St. Jude or St. Bill or St. Frank or whoever. It does not go through anybody except there is one man who is the mediator between God and men, and it is the man, Christ Jesus. He stands at the right hand of God, and when you pray, you are praying through Christ. You know why? Because God is a holy God. And you and I are sinners. And we have no right to go before a holy God and stand in front of Him or to speak to Him Christ condescended down, came down to our level, lived our life, and He and He alone has the authority and the right and the blessing. Christ loves God's people down here on this earth, and He wants to hear from them. Amen. And we, when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name because we know that Jesus is the mediator between us and a holy God. When I stand before God on Judgment Day, Jesus is going to stand and say to the Father, My blood has covered His sins. He has been forgiven. When we look in the book of His transgressions, those have been blotted out by My blood. He is a Son of God, and He is justified from all of His sins. And I say, Father, that He can come in to Your, to your kingdom in heaven. And what did I do to deserve that? Not a thing. So Revelation chapter 5. Verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. I want you to think about it. Written within and on the backside. Sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Those of you who know Revelation 5, tell me who it was that was worthy to open the book and loose the seals. Who is it? It's the Lamb, Jesus Christ. He and He alone is worthy to open that book. Those seals, those seven seals, they represent the Holy Spirit. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. I have it up on the screen. Open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. The Bible says, In whom you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Those seven seals represent the Holy Spirit of God, the set which the Bible calls the seven spirits of God. That's in Isaiah chapter 11. We won't go there. Uh, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer here just for a minute. And uh, I want you to pray for me as I preach this. Okay? Because I'm, I'm fumbling in my mind how, I'm, how God wants me to preach it. And I need help. So you pray for me this morning. All right? Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help me today. Lord, the message that I was working on, God, you changed it. I believe that it was you. And I thank you for it. And Lord, I, I thought, Lord, as I was getting this ready, that this would be easy and it would just come to me easy and I'd know how to do it. But Lord, I, I guess, Father, you want me to decrease while you increase. And so, Father, I pray, dear God, it doesn't bother me a bit if you humble me, humiliate me, Lord, with stammering speech and like I don't know what I'm doing, just so that your word and Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God would be magnified. Lord, if anything is done in anybody's heart today, if anything's done in anybody's life, if a sinner is saved, Lord, if a, if a saint, Lord, is blessed, if broken hearts are healed and mended, God, if backsliders are brought back to you, Lord, if there's any grace ministered today, Lord, that you would receive all the praise and all the glory for it. And I would be glad, Father, to give you the praise and the glory and the thanks. So, Father, may you be increased today and your word be magnified while I am decreased today. Lord, that's the only way I'll do it. 
Father, I thank you, Lord, for the gift of this book. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit and what that Spirit does in our lives. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just help me to put this together so that, Lord, it's simple, it's easily understood, and that Jesus is the one who opens it up, the hearts and the minds of these people, Lord, that, that hear it today. Lord, Father, deal with me as well as dealing with anybody else, Father. Correct me as you correct anybody else. Chasten me, Lord, as you chasten anybody else. Lord, just help us to preach this morning. I gladly submit to you, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. The title of this message, God was showing me something. It's called the Spirit of the Lord. If you remember from Isaiah chapter 11, when he lists the seven spirits of God, the very first one is called the Spirit of the Lord. And what I did was I just, I just looked at that phrase all through the Scriptures. I don't, think I've ever, I don't think I've ever preached a message on this one deal called the Spirit of the Lord. But as I was going through it in the Scriptures, I began to see how God was using this thing and how God was, God was dealing with me about, about different things in my life and how God's going to deal with you this morning. So I just kind of wanted you to know where I was going with it. What I, what I was going to do was going to preach on uh, liberty and not being entangled again with bondage. That's where I was going. And then God kind of took it a different direction and he corrected me. So as I stumble through this thing, I hope it's a blessing. Second Corinthians chapter 3, are you there? Say amen. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, and not as Moses. Now, let me back up a little bit. Here, Paul said in that previous verse, he said, we use plainness of speech and not as Moses. Uh, if you remember Moses, what was wrong with Moses? He was a stammerer. He was a stutterer. Now, I know Charlton Heston never stuttered one time in that movie. Okay? I mean, his, his diction and his words were very, very theatric. But the truth of it is, Moses was a stammerer. And God wanted it that way because a stammerer is somebody that's hard to understand. And the idea is, is that when the Jews, to whom the Old Testament was given, when the Jews read the Bible, they do not understand it, just like they had a hard time understanding what Moses was saying. Now, Paul, he's talking about the New Testament. He said, here we give the New Testament and we use plainness of speech and not as Moses. So that's where we pick it up in verse 13. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. And he's talking about the Old Testament law. The law and the guilt of the law is, is to be abolished and you can be forgiven of your sin. You can be forgiven of transgressing the Ten Commandments. Now, just as an open testimony to anybody, anybody here, anybody watching, I want a show of hands of everybody in this building who has broken the Ten Commandments. Look at there. You didn't know you were sitting in a house full of rotten, dirty, filthy, nasty people. Amen. Who have broken the laws of God. We're not here because we're good. We're here because Jesus is good. Amen. And so he's abolished the curse of the Old Testament on us. And uh, he said, verse 14, but he said, but their, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away. And here, here it is now, the reading of the Old Testament. When they read the Old Testament, they do not understand it. There's a veil over Moses' face. Which veil is done away in Christ? But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Who in here at one time the Bible was veiled to you and you did not understand it? Raise your hand. All the people all over the people all over the building, all over the world, people who are watching online, the Bible was a, was veiled to you. You did not understand it. And one day the Holy Ghost lifted that veil so you could plainly see what the Bible was really all about. Somebody say Amen. And you believe that you came from monkeys, and you believe that the world, the universe, thirteen and a half billion years old, and you don't believe that anymore. Amen. So now watch this, verse seventeen. Now the Lord. Is that spirit. And where, here it is, 
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, here's where I'm going with this. I, I've been teaching this in Sunday school. It is, it is everything that I believe, everything I stand for, everything I know. I know that God's Holy Spirit is real. It's a real part of who God is. It is a spirit that lives in us, but it is more than that. The Spirit of the Lord is the same as the very Bible that you're holding in your hand right now. So I want you to think about that. And, and let's read that again. Now the Lord, and who is the Lord? In fact, look up there, Revelation 19, 13. This is Jesus when He comes back and He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and His name is called what? Jesus and the Word of God, your Bible, they're one and the same. John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we don't see any separation here at this church, any separation or any difference between Christ and the Bible. Now, I'm going to kind of step off and, and unhook my train for a minute. I want you to think about that and turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. Remember that Jesus is the Word of God. That's His name. You can pray in the name of the Word of God. Amen? Because that's His name, the Word of God. And remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now watch this. Okay? Look in 2 Thessalonians 2. Look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now notice verse 4. Notice what your Bible says. This is talking about the Antichrist, the beast. He says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is what? Called God. What does that mean in the light of what we just said? He opposeth and exalts himself above the Bible. Because here is God. And the spirit of Antichrist will always oppose this book. And will always exalt itself above this book. Can I hear you say amen? This is why Jesus came. And when he left, he did not leave us by ourselves. He gave us his spirit. But He also gave us His Word. Now the Lord is that Spirit. Back in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Bible is, there's liberty. When our forefathers came to this land, they brought with them a Bible. They published Bibles. They distributed Bibles in this land. And this land was established forth by liberty, by the Word of God. When we cease to be a people that honors the recognition of the Word of God, when we stop being a people who oppose and exalt ourselves above the Word of God, there will be no more liberty in this land. When you, as a person, stop uh, believing the Bible, stop reading the Bible, stop having the Bible applied to your life, when you do that, you will find that your, your liberty is gone. Because you know what will happen? Devils will come and grab you and put you under bondage. Now, you've been in bondage before, have you not? Who wants to go back? I don't. So now watch. Second Samuel. Here's what, the, here's what the word of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Notice the connection here. So if I say to you, when we see the Spirit of the Lord in your Bible, it is your Bible. And your Bible is the Spirit of the Lord. Notice that verse again. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His Word was in my tongue. So do you believe it this morning? Say amen. Now watch this. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go through, and uh, in fact, I've already dealt with that. I'm going to go through, and I'm going to show you from the Bible what your Bible will do for you 
for your life, for your home, your family, for your relationships, what it will do in a church, what, it, what, what happens in a church or what happens in a family or a life or a nation where the Word of God is not present. Let's look at it from the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 10, if you want to turn there, I'll give you about three seconds. Uno, dos, tres. Y'all are good. 1 Samuel 10, verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Isn't that good? What kind of man were you, Wayne, before God got a hold of you and shook you? Not much. What kind of man were you, Jared, before God, before Jesus came into your life and shook you up and said, you need to get right? What kind of man were you? No, no, no. Chris, where is he? What kind of man was he? What kind of man were you, Jared? Scotty, what kind of man were you? Sterling, what kind of man were you before Jesus came into your life? Not very good. John. Rodden. George. Mike. Joe. Joe says, yep. I, I, I agree with all of them. Before the Spirit of the Lord came on you, you were nothing. You were a rotten, hell-deserving sinner. You were reprobate. Your actions and your deeds were immoral. You might have been a drunkard. You might have been someone who just cursed and swore all the time. You might have been a fornicator, an adulterer. You might have been any of these unclean things that men are right now. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon you, it turned you into another man. Amen. Somebody say amen. Listen, when, when, when his word comes into a, comes into a family, that family's different. When his word comes into a church, that church is different. God did things in me after he convinced me of his power in his word that were never done before that. And I'm a different man as a result of it. I'm not the man I, I'm not the man I want to be, but I'm not the man I used to be. This country needs a Bible revival. Your life needs a Bible revival. The Spirit of the Lord coming upon you will make you another man. And not the man you used to be. Now, watch this. That was Saul. 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, was King Saul. You know what King Saul did later? He rejected the word of the Lord. Do you know that happens with people? Linda, we've been in this church a long time. And we've seen men, we've seen women come in, lay things down at the altar, be in church for a while. And then they rejected the word of the Lord. I've seen it happen. I'm, I'm almost to where it doesn't surprise me anymore when I see it happen. Because, And let me show you what happens when somebody or let's say a church, a home, a nation. Let me show you what happens. In 1 Samuel 16, just six chapters later in Saul's life, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Why do I just... I'm, I'm on you all the time to read your Bible. 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 Meditate. You know what that means? Turn Dr. Phil off. Turn the soap operas off. Turn the comedy shows off. Turn the internet off. Read your Bible and then stop and think about what it's saying. There's been times when our country was great. And what is it great because of what we did? Because of what we accomplished? It was great because we had men who would get up 4 o'clock in the morning, put their overalls on, sit down in front of a coal oil lamp, read their King James Bible, and as they worked their fields and worked their farms and did their labor, 
That word was in their mind all day long. And they meditated on that. And God blessed this nation as a result of that. But what has happened in our nation? We have very few people in this country that actually even believe the Bible anymore. Most will reject it. And upon that rejection, God has allowed or God has sent a very evil spirit into this country. Do you not see it? What is it coming out of our television screens? Non-stop. What is it coming out of our radio stations? Non-stop. What is it that our politicians are all about? Non-stop. They're starting to get scared, aren't they? Because you've got all these women that are coming out and saying, He molested me. He did this to me. He did this to me. They did this to me. They're starting to come out now, and guys are on the run. Why? The Spirit of the Lord was pulled out. And an evil spirit was sent in. In the absence of this book, in any place, whether it's, whether it's this nation, or whether it's your home, or whether it's you personally, or even this church, in the absence of this book, God will send an evil spirit. The Bible's true, amen? Ezekiel 11, turn there. Ezekiel 11. I want you to see this in your Bible. Ezekiel 11. Shh. Get ready for this one, guys. Ladies, wouldn't you like to know sometimes what your husband was thinking? Sasha's going... Because sometimes you go, what were you thinking? Did you know the Bible knows your thoughts? In Ezekiel 11, verse 5, the Spirit of the Lord, there it is, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, thus have you said, O house of Israel, for here it is, I know the things that come into your mind every day one of them. Now look up here. When you stand before God in judgment, you're going to be judged upon the things that you did. You're going to be judged for the things that you said. God is also going to judge you for the thoughts that came into your mind. So, while you might have this sort of idea about yourself that you're a pretty good person, you do good things, and on the outward manifestation, what everybody sees of you, oh, they're a good person. They're, you know, that's what, that's what people say at a funeral. Oh, he was a good person. Oh, he did this, and he did that, and he did this. But there's a commandment that's part of the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Those are the things that we do and say. But there's the last one says, thou shalt not covet. Covetousness is nothing more than a thought. And this Bible knows and will find out every thought in your mind. When Jesus, who is this Bible, was here on earth, every time the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all those hypocrites came around him, the Bible says, and Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. You cannot outsmart God and you cannot outsmart this Bible. This Bible knows even your thoughts. So while you may hide behind your outer manifestation, this Bible, and the reason why you don't want to read it, is because when you read it, you'll read in here how God knew what you were thinking. You see... We're getting to the point now that when we use Google, we start typing something in and all of a sudden Google fills it out for us. Isn't that scary? That your computer now, because of all these things that you've typed in on the internet and looked for, the computer, Google, their artificial intelligence machine can almost read your mind. Guess what? It's only going to get worse. And if you're afraid of that, 
Why aren't you afraid of what God knows about you? Micah. Micah chapter 3, verse 8. But truly I am full of the power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. You know what this Bible you do when you read it? It will declare unto you your sin. And you've got them. And you don't want to read the Bible. You don't want to hear it preached. And that's because you've got sin. And this Bible is going to declare unto you your sin. You know what we hate? We hate somebody telling us that what we're doing is wrong. And we think it's okay. We think it's right. And then they pull out a Bible and read a verse to us. And it nails us. And we go, I hate that. Amen? Hate it. And we get mad. We're not mad at them. We're mad that our sin found us out, just like God said. This Bible and the reason why nobody wants it read in school, nobody wants it read in the colleges, nobody wants any, any religious or political leader read it, the reason why everybody wants the Bible to be kept inside of the churches and never out is because this Bible declares things that are sin and nobody wants to hear it anymore. That's the Spirit of the Lord. Micah chapter 2, verse 7. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord straightened? Now I had to look that up. Straightened. You know what that means? Restrained. So let me put it like this. Is the Spirit of the Lord restrained? Are these His doings? And then look at what He said. He connected it together. Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Did you know that this Bible has power that cannot be restrained? It cannot be stopped. It cannot be altered in, or restrained in such a way as it will not affect your life. And again, think of all the people in the world who do not want a Bible brought into their life in any way. They don't want you bringing up the Bible at the family get-together. You can't bring up the Bible at work. They don't want you. They'll turn you in. They don't want the Bible brought into the schools. They don't want the Bible brought into the courtrooms. They want this Bible gone. And the reason is, this Bible has power and it has force and it's going to do exactly what God said it will do. And they don't want that and the devil doesn't want that. You say, how does that work, Pastor? Well, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. You know what happened? And there was light. And God said, let us make man in our image. You know what happened? There was man. God's Word took absolutely nothing and turned it into everything. So much so that the scientists cannot even fathom, really, what this universe is all about. They, they cannot even fathom the depths of the wisdom of this creation. And they don't even want to think of it as a creation. They just think this is, you know, this all came together by nothing. But it was God's Word. God's Word in your life will not be restrained. God will end up doing things in you or, let me say this, God will end up doing things that you don't want done. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Years ago, a guy that I really had a soft spot for, I was trying to, he said he got saved and I was trying to be a good brother to him. I, I worked with him at one time. He wanted to borrow some money from me. And I knew better. Because he was not good with money. He was doing some kind of painting job, so I let him do it. He ended up taking about $500 out of a paint account that I had at a paint store. 
and bought a bunch of stuff for himself, and my repeated calls to him were just, he was saying, well, the job's not done yet, job's not done yet, job's not done yet. And then I talked to him, and he finally admitted that the money that he borrowed from me and the money that he made from that job he's, is gone. So I went, and it bothered me, and I went and prayed about it. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. I said, God, show me in your word that this guy is going to pay me back. Because I knew my wife had done told me, you loaned him money, I'm not paying it back for you. You're going to pay it back yourself. So what I ended up doing was selling some equipment that I had to pay this guy's debt off. So it wouldn't ruin my credit. Okay? And so I did. I prayed. I said, God, and this was my pride. God, show me in your word that he's going to pay it back. That way my wife will not be right. <laughs> and you know what I read? I opened my Bible up. It was in the Psalms. I do not remember where it was. But it was in the Psalms and it said, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. And I closed the Bible and I went, another place. <laughs> Did you know that that verse was exactly the verse God wanted to show me that day? And that guy to this day has never paid that back. And I was out all that money. God's word was not going to be restrained by my wishes. And sometimes we want God's word to say nice things to us. And sometimes God's word's not going to say nice things to us. Deal with it. Amen? I'm almost done. Isaiah 59, 18, look at this. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay, repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Now watch this. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. You know what a standard is? This is a standard. Amen? You know what I, you know, I just wanted to do a backflip yesterday when I heard they played the Army-Navy game yesterday in that snow down in Georgia. They played that Army-Navy game. And did you know that nobody, when they played the national anthem, got down on their knee in opposition to our nation? And I wanted to do a backflip over that, but I figured I'd end up in the hospital. I'm one of these guys that... When, when I see old Mel Gibson in that movie, The Patriot, take this flag and go run it into battle, I want to get up and go run into battle somewhere. Isn't this a, isn't this a beautiful thing? This is the, listen, this is the standard of a great nation. And I love my nation. Amen. And listen, just waving this flag into, into battle will cause our soldiers to rise up and say, let's go get the enemy. Amen. Now look at your Bible. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Yet listen, the Spirit of the Lord and your Bible will conquer the flood of the enemy. Somebody say amen. Amen. See, this is why, this is why the, lib the same liberals that hate the Bible, that ought to tell you something. Nasty bunch. I hope Trump tweets their case every single day. Amen? Isaiah chapter 40. Look at this. All you smart people. I, I don't think there's anybody in this church like this, but I run into people like this all the time. They are such whizzes at the Bible. They think they know everything, and they think they know more than any man, and they think they know more than God. You know Why? Because they think the Bible has got mistakes in it. And so they correct it because they're smarter than God is. Now you look at your Bible, Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or being His counsel, hath taught Him? What, what was it that you taught God one day? What smart thing did you come up with that God said, oh, I'm going to write that down. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him in the path of judgment? And taught him knowledge? And showed him to him the way of understanding? Who is it that is smarter than your Bible? Who's smarter than the Spirit of the Lord? 
Who is it that counseled God? Who is it that gave God understanding? Who is it that thinks that they can have their way and make God yield to it? You'd be surprised at the number of people who think that. Now I'm done. Isaiah 63, 14. Turn there. This, I decided to finish with this verse because this verse talked about a rest. And this is what I'm going to let you do here in a minute. Isaiah, unless some of you have been doing it already during the sermon. Isaiah 63, 14. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. You know what this Bible's good for? When you have a troubled spirit, when you read it, God gives you rest. Just like, and I don't know if you've seen this, cows and stuff like that, they'll be up on the hill grazing. And in that late afternoon, they'll just kind of wander down into that valley, down in the heat, when, when the summertime, when it's cool down in there. And that's where they'll lay down and that's where they'll rest. God wants to bring you to a peaceful valley. And the Bible is what's going to lead you there. You have no better remedy in your life for a troubled spirit than to just read this book and let God put peace in your heart where you didn't have it before. God wants you to rest. And so do I. So I'm going to quit preaching. But I want you to bow your head. I want you to give God some time. Again, I, I don't think I... I guess the main thing I wanted to say was that God's Holy Spirit is always going to move you to read your Bible. Always. And these issues that I preached on this morning, if you found yourself being in need of God to stave off the flood of your enemies, which could be your own emotions, your own feelings about things. Emotions can be some powerful enemies. Sin is a very powerful enemy. Pride, very powerful enemy. And when that enemy comes in like a flood, you've got the Spirit of the Lord there with you. When they see that Bible and you reading it, they'll run. God knows your thoughts. Any of these things that God was showing us today, they're all in your Bible. And I want to encourage you again as God's people. Read your Bible. Read it more. Read it more. So I'm going to give you a minute with God. And let God wrestle with you and you wrestle with God a little bit. And if you want to come down to one of these benches, you are more than welcome to. I'm not going to restrain you. I'm going to let God just do what God wants to do in you. But I'm hoping and praying that Jesus opened up the book to you today. He did me.